Good evening. Uh, Deputy Minister for Development and Investment um, for Innovation, Research and Technology, Christos Dimas, Professor Bilolet, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, on behalf of MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, I welcome everyone here tonight at our event, Building Greek Startups the MIT Way. We are thrilled to have tonight with us Bilolet, Managing Director of the Martin Trust Center of Entrepreneurship and Professor of the Practice at the MIT Sloan School of Management. Bill tonight is here tonight with another hat, an author's hat. His book, Discipline Entrepreneurship, 24 Steps to a Successful Startup, is translated into Greek by Nikos Theodorakis, professor of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki, with the Greek title, Epihirimatikotita me Arches. Uh, this book has been the primary education material for our acceleration program since we started in 2013. EY honored us, and especially Dr. Kostadinos Moros, Director of Global Consulting Products and Platforms at EY, who taught the book in our program for eight consecutive years. We will start tonight by having brief opening remarks from these event co-organizers, Meet of Greece, MIT uh, Club of Greece, and the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. We will continue with uh, short welcome comments from our esteemed minister. We are also waiting for Deputy Minister for Higher Education Issues, Mr. Angelos Sirigos. And then Dr. Kostadinos Moros and Professor Nikos Theodorakis will make short prefaces for the book and lay the carpet for Bill's presentation. Uh, we will have plenty of time our, afterwards for questions and Q&As, moderated by Vasilis Papakostadino. At the end, 10 lucky participants will win one book, signed, of course, by Bill. Uh, for all of you interested to buy more books, you, they are available downstairs in the lobby at the gift shop of Evionides Foundation. And now, let's uh, call on stage Gerasimos Peridakis, Meet of Greece Chairman, for his welcome. Thank you, Gerasimos. Deputy Minister of Research and Technology, Mr. Dimas. Deputy Minister of Higher Education Issues, Mr. Sirigos. Professor Bilolet. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome. MIT Enterprise Forum Greece is dedicated to informing, connecting, coaching and accelerating technology entrepreneurs, enabling them to rapidly transform ideas into world-changing companies. Since we founded MIT Enterprise Forum in Greece approximately 10 years ago, we have accelerated 177 teams, of which 77 went to their respective finals, and 57 of them we know are continuing and growing at a global level. In total, they have raised hundreds of millions of dollars from Greek and foreign investors, and as were purely funded, by sponsorships and donations, this return on funding that we have achieved as an organization is close to 100 times. So this means that we can proudly claim that the funds available that we get from sponsorships are giving our startups, our partners, the opportunity to participate in this important multiplication of value of the Greek society, and that's very important. Last year, in the competition of 2021, we had very strong teams that raised the level of the organization at a new high. It became clear to us that there is an interesting potential in deep tech, in health, etc. This year, 2022, we have started the campaign with some changes. We have a new track dedicated into life sciences, we transformed last year's shipping and maritime to, into a broader spectrum um, called transportation, logistics, and maritime. And we also aim to attract international teams. So we made a lot of presentations, not just in Greece, in the universities and the research institutions, but also abroad. 
In just this year alone, 20% of our teams are outside of Greece. And we are hoping and we will try to increase that number to even higher. And we became a hub for entrepreneurship in Southern Balkans. So when we started MITF uh, Greece 10 years ago, we said at the time that we wanted to make Greece a tech hub for 2021. We put nine years of acceleration. The recent developments in Greece, as you all know, have proven that to everybody that this is definitely happening. And we're very proud that we have made a very significant contribution to this success, both in Greece, but also through the partnerships and what we have achieved with some friends and partners outside of Greece, like the Hellenic Innovation Network in Boston, etc. So as part of this effort, we continue to engage with obviously MIT University and the global startup ecosystem. And this is why we're so happy tonight to have Bill as our keynote speaker. Uh, so I'm gonna send a couple of words about, very brief about Bill. He's the managing director of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship and professor of the practice at the MIT Sloan uh, School of Management. He's an award um, winning educator and author whose current work is built on the foundation of his 25 years of successful business career, first at IBM and then having founded and very successfully exited some of, uh, some of uh, startups as a serial entrepreneur. During his time, he raised hundreds of millions of dollars, and more importantly, he created hundreds of millions of dollars of shareholder value through those organizations. Since 2009, he's been responsible for leading the development of entrepreneurship, education, courses across MIT at the Martin Trust Center. Bill's first book, Discipline Entrepreneurship, was released in August 2013. It's been translated into over 18 languages and has been the content for three online EDX courses, which have been taken by hundreds of thousands of people in 199 different countries. The accompanying follow-up book, Discipline and Entrepreneurship Workshop, was later published in 2017. Bill has widely published in places like Wall Street Journal, TechTrans, The Boston Globe, Sloan Management Review, etc. And of course, he's been a featured speaker in many places, in CNBC, uh, Squawk Box, BBC News, Bloomberg News, and of course, as a keynote speaker at events and conferences around the world. He has a degree from Harvard and MIT, and he's a board member in NASDAQ listed companies, but also private companies. I'm gonna close by saying that Bill is changing the way entrepreneurship is understood, taught, and practiced around the world. So it's a real pleasure and an honor to have with us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerasimus. And now, let's have on stage Ephthemius, Ephthemius Nikolopoulos, which is the president of uh, MIT Club of Greece. Dear all, thank you all for joining our event today. I would like to warmly welcome Bill. It is an honor to have you here as a guest speaker today. As president of the MIT Club of Greece, I would like to start by reminding to us the mission of the MIT Sloan School of Management, which is to develop principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and to generate ideas that advance management practice. Many of those innovative leaders are becoming entrepreneurs, either driving new business models and ideas in the corporate world or creating their own startups. They are trying to have an impact on the world's greatest challenges while often are creating hundreds of thousands of jobs 
adding to the prosperity of the society. Greece is in an era when entrepreneurship is growing and new startups are being developed by passionate teams of talented and devoted people. In many cases, these are, these are people coming from universities or companies abroad who want to devote their passion and learnings starting from solving challenges of the Greek society. This is why today's session of building Greek startups the MIT way is more relevant than ever. I feel really lucky since as an MIT Sloan alumnus, I had the privilege to participate in Bill's class. I still have in my mind one of Bill's quotes uh, in the class when he told, us, he told us that entrepreneurs have the spirit of a pirate and the discipline of a Navy SEAL. One of the critical elements in this difficult journey of entrepreneurship is to follow a structured approach that can provide practical guidance on how to create a successful startup and can help the team remain efficient and disciplined. I know that you are looking forward to learning more from Bill, so I will not say more. I just want to add that Bill's book, which is amazing and is being taught at MIT, has finally been translated in Greek. And I'm confident, and that I believe all of you will agree, that this will hopefully become the standard of entrepreneurship in Greece and will help all the future generations of Greek entrepreneurs. Welcome again, Bill, and we're truly excited to have you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thymios. And now, let's um, call to the stage Christos Dimas, Deputy Minister. Deputy Minister Sirigos, uh, Professor Bill Lollet, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to start by congratulate, congratulating the MIT Enterprise Forum for uh, not only organizing today's event uh, for the launch of uh, Bill Lollet's book uh, in Greek, uh, but actually for being very active in the startup uh, and innovation ecosystem, especially in the last years, which I consider a very, very uh, important issue. Uh, I would briefly like to tell you a few things about the government's policy regarding the startup uh, innovation ecosystem in the last two and a half years. First of all, up until recently, the Greek state did not know how many startups we had, in which sector they were, how many people they employed, uh, what uh, funding they, they had achieved. So we didn't have data about the startup ecosystem. When you lack data, it is very difficult to implement successful policies. So we had to know to who we were actually speaking to, uh, which was our audience uh, as a government. Uh, through Elevate Greece, uh, we have created uh, a startup registry, but uh, it has actually evolved within a very uh, small period of time to something that is much more than a startup agency. Uh, so through Elevate Greece, we have uh, legislated um, incentives for uh, angel investors, for uh, stock options. Uh, we even had uh, uh, an activity uh, through the cohesion funds to support the liquidity uh, of, the, of the startups uh, due to the pandemic crisis. But we have also built a very important group of, uh, of uh, official partners of Elevate Greece, and we're very proud that the MIT Enterprise Forum is one of our institutional supporters uh, of, this, uh, of this initiative. So we, it has evolved into a tool for the government and the startup ecosystem, concentrating both public policies, but also private initiatives uh, to help the startup ecosystem uh, further. Um, apart from that, we have uh, initiated actions uh, in order to uh, create innovation uh, clusters, competence centers, uh, uh, technology transfer offices, uh, and uh, we have uh, recently changed with the Ministry of Education uh, all of the framework, the legislatory framework regarding the operation of, uh, of spin-off companies. So we are trying to see how we can fuel up the innovation ecosystem because we believe that we, we share the same goals with uh, MIT Enterprise Forum. We do believe that Greece 
uh, is evolving into the main uh, research and innovation hub of southeastern Europe. We still have a lot to do uh, if we want to take advantage of all, all our all our abilities of, of the amazing talent that we have in, in Greece. But we also, Bill, we had a very interesting discussion in, in my office in the morning. Apart from talented individuals, we also have a lot of discipline, something that is not well known uh, uh, outside Greece. And it was actually uh, under, uh, we were under uh, attack from many countries about this lack of discipline. We want to show that Greek entrepreneurs are very talented, but also they have a lot of uh, discipline. Something like Yanis at the Tokubo, uh, because I know we share a common interest, not only for entrepreneurship, but, uh, but basketball. So uh, summing up, uh, I do want to say that uh, uh, initiatives like today's uh, event, but also all of the events at the MIT Enterprise Forum are, are initiatives that we warmly welcome. Uh, we encourage them. We're very happy to participate. Uh, and we are also very happy that uh, we have uh, Professor Ole today uh, with us. And uh, we do encourage uh, everybody to, to uh, buy the book, read the book, and uh, learn about entrepreneurship. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. Mr. Dimas, it's always an honor having you by our side. You elevate Greece and all the people. So now let's welcome on stage Mr. Uh, Deputy Minister Angelo Sirigos, Deputy Minister of Higher Education. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Deputy Minister Christos Dimas, Professor Bilolé, dear all, it is a great pleasure to be here with you today. Let me congr congratulate the MIT Enterprise Forum for this initiative. Uh, Mr. Dimas explained uh, the policy of the government regarding uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, he's responsible for this uh, very important part of uh, the Greek uh, of the policy of the present government. I represent here uh, Greek universities. The Greek universities in the past, well, until quite recently, were divided from entrepreneurship. There was an idea that entrepreneurship was something that had to be outside the universities. People in the universities were devoted to knowledge without any practical implications of knowledge. We are trying to change this idea. Recently, we had a new law. We created a new law uh, with uh, Minister Christos Dimas, which is about startup companies and uh, spin off companies in the universities. And we believe that uh, we're going to have a new environment in the universities regarding entrepreneurship. From this point of view, your book about disciplined entrepreneurship, which offers us a comprehensive, integrated and uh, proven step-by-step -step approach, is very important and I strongly believe that uh, it will be a, an extremely useful tool for all universities. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Minister, Mr. Sirigos. And now, let's welcome on stage Dr. Kostadinos Moros to make his comments about the teaching of the book all these years. Good evening, everyone. And thank you for the invitation. Now, over the last uh, eight years, through the collaboration of EY Greece and MIT Enterprise Forum Greece, the book by Professor Bill Ollett has been used as the main backbone of the workshops I'm delivering to the startups, which are chosen to attend the competitions bootcamp each year. 
Due to my role as the main lecturer and trainer of these workshops, I can highlight three main reasons why each year we receive very high ratings about the startupers' experience as well as the overall value they derive. Firstly, because the book's structure offers a very clear guidance of the sequential steps that the startup should follow in the form of a journey for increasing its probability of success and growth. Secondly, because it offers concrete answers and actionable insights to typical important challenges faced by startups, regardless of their market focus or geographic location. Thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, because the book is doing a great job in simplifying difficult but often complicated subjects, methods and tools which are of vital importance for any startup. As a result, even though startuppers may be at first a bit skeptical about the demanding nature of the workshops, as well as the amount of knowledge they need to absorb and uh, the work they need to do, by the end of each year's learning journey, they understand why they need to trust the process of the 24 steps presented in the book, and they also appreciate the term discipline entrepreneurship, which may sound paradox at first, but later on it becomes very obvious. As such, judging by this eight-year average assessment of 9.2 out of 10 from 180 roughly technology startups and more than 450 entrepreneurs, who are considered, by the way, a highly knowledgeable and demanding audience, I believe that this book does an invaluable service to the quality of entrepreneurial learning and startup activity. EY Greece and me personally are proud of this achievement, as well as our contribution to the growth of Greek technological entrepreneurship. And I would like to thank Bill, as this would not have been possible without his book. Last but not least, I'm really glad that it will now be offered in Greek as well, since this will further accelerate the pace of building Greek startups the mighty way. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Moros. It's been always an honor to have you in our program. And now, let's welcome on stage Nicolas Theodorakis, Professor of Sport Management, Director of the Laboratory of Sports Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. Uh, Mr. Deputy Ministers, Mr. Dimas and Mr. Sirigos, Bill, ladies and gentlemen, it feels very strange for me. After two years, I removed my masks. Even in the class, we have to wear it. Well, uh, a few years ago, Bill uh, had a, a workshop, Bill, in Copenhagen, if you remember. And he presented himself like, he, like this. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, and by accident, I'm a professor. I'm totally the opposite. Uh, all my life, I was a professor at Aristotle University, and now, in my mid-50s, I became an entrepreneur. Uh, a short story how, how I did this and why I decided to bring, uh, I'm not an MIT guy, why so I decided to bring Bill's book here in Greek. Uh, what was the purpose behind this decision? Uh, a few years ago, in those long, hot Greek summer that usually professors go under an umbrella, I had an idea to to, become, uh, to start a small company. Then, because of the new fruitful environment, someone from the university told me to, to create a spin-off company. Uh, that's easy for me, you know, I'm a professor. Professors, you know, they know, we know everything. Then I placed my paper in a, in a local incubator that everybody knew me. I'm quite famous in my neighborhood. And then, uh, and they rejected me. Say, what? How can you reject me? I know how to write business plan. You know, Nick, uh, you have a great idea, but we're not looking for this. We're looking for new. You're doing something like what Bill calls uh, small SMEs type of companies. Uh, we looked for more something more innovative. 
but my idea is, but, yes, but you don't know how to write it. And how can I do that? Okay, get this book. And someone, it's actually the Manolis from our transfer of knowledge office in the university, gave me uh, Bill's book. I read it. I went through three cycles. I created a spin-off company and I uh, got funded two days ago. N not by the state. And then I decided if I can make it in my mid-50s, why I have to, to do the same for my students. And uh, this is why we edited the book in Greece, in Greek. Uh, does this mean that we're going to create new entrepreneurs? I'm not very sure, to be honest. Despite the new environment, as the deputy minister uh, said before a while, which is really good for us, uh, it takes a lot more than book and professors to create entrepreneurs in Greek universities. So far, we lack the mindset and then the culture. So if you would like to do something more for us, I think this is what we have to, to fight for. Uh, Big ha has some ideas, Bill. I think you're going to express your ideas later on. And that was the short story behind the, the Greek edition of, the, of this uh, great book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Theodorakis. And now I think it's a big time. Bill, the stage is all yours. Thank you. So first of all, you're going to learn I'm not a politician, so I don't have a big polished talk here. Um, and I'm going to make all kinds of mistakes, which my, my wonderful wife will point out to me later tonight. <laughs> For those who aren't married, um, when you get married, your spouse is a one-person QA department for everything you do. <laughs> is that true in Greece as well? Uh, I mean, yeah, very much so. My wife leaves <laughs> so first of all, I, I, need, I need to thank uh, a number of people here. You know, first, first of all, Antigone, you've been wonderful. Where's the executive director? Thank you. You've been wonderful in making this all so possible and coming to MIT and convincing, uh, convincing me along with Vasilius, where's Vasilius, to, to come over here. Um, there's a lot of uh, Greeks at MIT. I, I couldn't believe it when I got here. There's only 10 million Greeks in Greece. I mean, I thought like this place is huge. <laughs> but it's, it's one of these things where you're overrepresented. You punch above your weight, as they say, in uh, universities and the like, which I think you know. Um, it, 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 uh, uh, Gerasmus, I just met last night, and boy, what a dinner did we have. Where are you? Yeah, this is, I was, I was talking all about entrepreneurs, and you know, entrepreneurs are making the world great, and they're the good people, and the, and the bad people are all these bankers who are trying to bring it down with all their, and he said, I'm a banker. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. We had a great conversation about it, and, and that your support, what MIT Enterprise Forum doing is just unbelievable, unbelievable. Um, it's really making a difference. And, and, and uh, Minister Christos, we sure had fun this morning. And I saw you. I didn't realize what, a, 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 what you were doing here. And then to see the program you're doing with Elevate. And we were just talking about how in basketball, nothing good happens quickly. If something good happens, it's like you sprained your ankle. To become good at basketball, it takes a long time. And um, to, to create a great entrepreneurial ecosystem will take a while. But you know, first you got to have the systems in place, and Elevate is really great. And then we got to have the academic institutions chipping in, and, and that's where the deputy minister, deputy minister, Constantinidos comes in. Uh, you guys working together and sitting together, you know, is a, is a really good sign because it takes systems and it takes talent, and we got to generate that talent internally, um, and get some of it hopefully from our refugees that are, will be coming from. Uh, other places that you might see in the news these days. So hopefully we can inter integrate them. And, and Nikos, uh, you know, it's not just it's not just translating. What I've learned over this. It's actually I think it's 22 now. I forget where it was. Who said? Oh, uh, It's like 22 different versions. And one thing I've learned is I'm not that smart. But the translator, if you just run the book through Google Translate, it's not that great uh, because you, you don't get all the nuances. But Nikos actually. He felt bad. He was like calling up saying, I, ha I hate to bother you, but asking those questions made this, this version really good. And this is, I'm learning stuff from this, where hopefully there'll be another version. Can you hear it? Or do I have to? Yeah. Am I on? Speak over the microphone. Please, uh, hold your microphone. There's a portable mic? 
Do I have to stay here? Can I get a level, level here? If I can get a portable, I, it's hard for me to stand still. I'm an entrepreneur. <laughs> so Nikos has really you know, done a terrific job on the translation, and I'm deeply indebted to you for that, um, even if you are a professor. I didn't know professors could do productive things for society, but <laughs> you're changing my mind about that. Um, that's why, please don't call me a professor. When you come up, just call me Bill. Um, and Manolis, Manolis, where are you? That you, you were the one that introduced him to this. Yeah, thank you very, very much. And, and, and the former students, there's Fotis, who's, who's, who's also a professor. Um, thank you for your support. And the other students out here, where are the other students I had at MIT? Yeah, and you, you guys survived, uh, which is amazing. So, but now what I wanted to do quickly here is I'm gonna go through a presentation just to kind of set the stage. Oh, oh. And my wife gave me some other notes I was supposed to. She said, pick up the laundry and go pick up these things at the grocery store. Apples, orange, no, I'm just kidding. She said, I need to thank um, Neurotologies, Aliki for a great, Aliki and Nat Natasa. Yes, thank you for taking my wife to see the Acropolis. That was great. All right, so let me just, I want to talk about you know, what we, we, we believe makes for great entrepreneurs and what we've seen makes for great entrepreneurs. Because I think as, as uh, Deputy Minister of Higher Education said, entrepreneurship was something that was done outside universities. And now we realize we should be teaching this inside of universities because um, first of all, it's very, it's very important, but it can be taught. So um, we have empirical data that shows that not only can entrepreneurship be learned, it can be taught. And I'm just gonna, I've got lots more information on any of this if any of you are interested. And let me show you why we know it can be taught. When we, if you ask people what's the success rate of entrepreneurs, students who learn entrepreneurship start new ventures, people say maybe 10%, maybe less, maybe a little bit more. I don't know where those numbers come from. I've looked it up on the internet and I've found these kind of studies. I can tell you that the students that come out of our programs, they succeed at a 75% rate, meaning they're still in business five years later. Um, and that mean, and then we just did another study and it came out at 73%. But even some of these people whose companies are not operating, they feel that they've been dramatically empowered and they go out and do other things. Like you're working at AstraZeneca now and that has been, um, he's an entrepreneur at AstraZeneca and that's what these big companies need. I'm gonna talk about that. So. And then we saw that when we teach this material, we take existing entrepreneurs, this is for Northern Ireland, and you can see that within one year doing a program like this, their revenue went from 4.2 million pounds to 24 point, or 25 million. So this stuff works, you can teach entrepreneurship. That's point number one. The second thing is people say, but I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not an entrepreneur. There's only a select group of people who are entrepreneurs. This is just not true. This is fundamentally not true. And uh, let me just say that everyone, human beings are born entrepreneurs. There was nobody back in ancient times of Mesopotamia or in Greece who, who was dying on the side, you know, dying in the sidewalk saying, I can't live, I can't, I, I need to get on LinkedIn to get a job. I need to get a job at a big corporation. You know, I, I can't polish up my resume. What did people do? They went out and they built things, they traded things, they provided services to other people. Of course they did, because they needed to survive. But our educational system, the kind of what we've done over time, has pulled, sucked out of entre entrepreneurial zeal out of people and their confidence. And that is something that we need to change, because all human beings are entrepreneurs. We wouldn't, it's a Darwinian selection process. What's the matter, Vasilis? Uh, it seems like the Oh, my battery's getting low. Is it plugged in? It should be plugged in. Well, that, that will be a disaster. Well, that might be good news for you if, I, if this runs out. Okay, so let, let, me just, let me just keep talking. Oh, I need this. Well, they're figuring it out. Is we're all born entrepreneurs. The system takes it out of us. So if we're, if we're born entrepreneurs, what are we going to do about this? And this situation, this situation is getting a lot more important, a lot more important. And, I, and I'm going to talk about that since we've seen, you know, COVID made it crystal clear. 
So we can teach entrepreneurship. Everyone can be an entrepreneur. How do we do that at MIT? Well, first of all, if you're an engineer, which MIT is an engineering school above all else, you don't start solving a problem until you define your terms. So what is entrepreneurship? What is entrepreneurship? I'm going to start with the very basics, you know. Um, by the way, John Wooden, before he started teaching basketball, he would sit down and say, okay, now sit down, everybody. I'm going to teach you how to put on your socks and how to put on your shoes, because if you don't put on your socks and shoes right, you're never going to be a good basketball player. So you have to start with fundamentals and build from there. So what is entrepreneurship? Entrepreneurship is there is, you know, entrepreneurs go in and there is no organization or company or venture, and they create a new one out of nothing. That's what entrepreneurs do. They create. They create things. And those entrepreneurs that create these things, they do it by generating value for someone and extracting value from somebody else. It might be the same person. I might sell him a product and get him to pay for it, or I might, I might give him, I'm, I'm sorry, I might create value for him and extract value from him, or I might create value for him and extract it over here. Um, either way, that rent that's extracted has to exceed the cost of the business. So what that means is, um, this is an e exercise in economic sustainability, economic sustainability. And that's a good thing, because now the market, or the, the, the customer is telling you what's good and what's not good. And once you do that, you have to focus on how do I create value for someone, and who's going to pay for that? This simple discipline makes you very, very effective at doing the right things and not getting caught in what the wrong things are. So it's the market at work, which we, we, we know has positive and negative aspects to it. So if that's what entrepreneurship is, which is pretty clear, well, what, what else is there to know about it? Well, there's two types of entrepreneurs. There's small, medium enterprise entrepreneurs who create restaurants, who create nail salons, who create IT service companies. And this is what we're talking about. And those people basically are creating, you know, entities that are serving a local market. There's not, you know, it's kind of like a, a doctor and a dentist. That's great, but they're just so, so that's not a scalable business. That's not something that's a real product business. So when we talk about, um, what happened? Did my battery just run out? Can you put your button? Yeah. Did my battery just run out or what? What's this picture of Vladimir Putin? It's right there. It's plugged in and it's charging. Okay, good. One percent. It flat ran out. Okay. Maybe it was a. Yeah. So if we just go to here. Sorry, everybody, this, this will be faster if I just take a second to recover this. Okay. Oh, I don't even look at full screen. Okay. All right. So, um, Go through this. So there's two types of entrepreneurship that we talk about. Small, medium enterprise, which, which is really kind of a trading business or something that's not adding a tremendous amount of innovation or value to it. And there's nothing wrong with these. You know, these things are, are, are the foundation of a society because they're non-tradable jobs, they're geographically distributed, they're, they're, they're very, very, very good. Um, and, you know, by the way, no offense to the politicians here, Politicians love these things because they're very rapid turnaround. The cause and effect between when I do something, if I'm a dentist and I add a new chair, I will get more revenue. If I'm a restaurant and I add a new table, I should be getting more, all things being equal. That means the response, delta T, you know, for, to my Harvard friends, delta T means the time delay. Um, <laughs> you don't think that's funny, Erasmus? Um, this means the system has low inertia. 
that if I try something, I, get a, I, I quickly get a response to it. And these things will get linear growth, and then, um, but they cap out at some point because they're not scalable product businesses. But they're, really, they're, they're good in a lot of ways, and they don't require as much investment. On the other hand, if you want to tra create a highly scalable business, we call these innovation-driven enterprise, where you're going after much bigger markets than your local area, Athens or the town you're in. or you know, These things have an innovation that will allow you to go to other markets and export. And when you do that, the nature of this, of this system is that the time delay be when I try something, I say, I got an idea for a new product. You know, it, you have to develop that product. You have to develop the innovation, the, the idea behind technology. The, and, and then once you've done that, this, this here, this investment here, this debt, then you will start to see the results and it will grow exponentially. So you'd say, okay, great. I want that exponential growth because this is capped. I want exponential better than linear and I want this. The problem is, is that there's a time delay between when you make this investment and when you see the results. And so this is a very risky area. This is what they often call the valley of death over here. And this is the challenge of innovation-driven entrepreneurship. How do, you, how do you make small enough investments here so that you're, you're not putting this at risk and that you will come out the other end and convincing people who are going to have to fund you or support you during this critical time here. This is when you're in the NEDO Native Intensive Care Unit right here, that you, you are going to come out and stand up and be this, this super athlete at the end of it. Um, and that's the challenge. And this is, you want this and this. This is very hard though. This is, the, this is what we're teaching people, how to build these companies. And these are the companies that are going to transform economies are going to solve the intractable problems that we face as a society. These companies over here. And so this is what we focus on right now, and this is what the MIT Enterprise Forum is focused on. And so you say, well, okay, that was great. Well, what is innovation? What's, you, you want to define things? Tell me what innovation is. Oh, that innovation, people will say, equals invention. It equals R&D. That is not true. That is not true. Just to be clear to everybody in this room, that is not true. R&D costs you money. R&D costs you money. Innovation makes you money. So these aren't the same thing. And, 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 and society often gets these confused. A lot of people, oh, I have a new idea. I have a technology. I have a patent. Those things cost money. Innovation makes you money. What's missing in this equation is this strange thing called commercialization. Harder to measure, because we love to measure PhDs and patents and things like that. But in fact, they're useless unless you can commercialize them. Yes, you need some new ideas and invention. This can't be zero, but and, uh, you get no innovation. But this can't be zero, otherwise you get no innovation. And we as a society overinvest in this, and, and certainly in, in this side of it, and we underinvest in this because it's harder to measure. It's kind of this black box that we've never understood, and we don't, we don't give out PhDs in it and patents. But this actually, I would argue, is much more important. When you look at the most innovative companies in the world today, uh, Apple, their fundamental inventions, they didn't even invent. The, the fundamental invention for, for the computer that they transformed the computer came from Xerox Park, Xerox Park, but they were unable to commercialize that. And when you go after that, you say, well, that was just one off. Then they changed the music industry. What's the fundamental breakthrough in the music industry? It is MP3. MP3 was invented by, does anyone know here? It was invented by Fraunhofer. And you've never, you know, you've heard of Fraunhofer, but they're not a multi-trillion dollar organization. And, and we could go on and on about this. And it, it, commercialization, you know, Google, was Google a new idea? No, it wasn't at all. And the, it, the key invention there was the advertising model, and that came from Overture. And some might people say, well, they're stealing technology. Well, that's called lateral innovation, ladies and gentlemen. That's called lateral innovation. And you should encourage that because the Chinese, that is precisely what they do, and that's what the Samner brothers do. If you see a new idea, and there's this uh, Nobel Prize winner named Bank Holmstrom, who's going to talk at our symposium next month about this, is we over, overrate technological disrupt, disruptive technologies, and we undervalue imitation. That is taking a good idea and applying it in the context 
so that it creates innovation. And you could go, we could go on and on about this all, all day, but I, we don't have time. So if you looked at that, you'd say, ah, I'm a, I, understand, I understand math, even if you're an economist. You know, eco this is so simple, an economist could do it, right? Let me just, that was a little trash talking, sir. <laughs> Um, it, it, I'm just going to make this as high as I can and make this as high as I can, and then I'll have the most innovation. It's not that easy. Because at IBM, where I, I worked for 11 years, we had the greatest invention machine the IT industry has ever seen. Most patents, most technology, the Thomas Watson Research Center. Only thing that's ever come close is Bell Labs, but they weren't in the IT industry. And we had the most powerful commercialization organization you've ever seen. But here's the problem they didn't work well together, or they weren't designed to work well together. They were siloed. And when, we, when it was that, when an idea we saw in the marketplace, we wanted to get over here, it took a year to get that product out of there and back over here or more. So clock speed is essential here. It's essential to not only have innovation, I mean, invention and commercialization. Those two things have to work very closely together. And Thomas Edison said this, who was a far inferior inventor to Nikola Tesla, but he said, innovation is the number of times I can iterate on a new idea within the first 24 hours when I have it. And this is why startups generally are much, much more innovative, because they get in a room and they, they work very rapidly to iterate. So, um, so I just want to say that right now we are very clear that like when this book first started, we were focused on startups. Startups is entrepreneurship. But I'll tell you today, entrepreneurs must be throughout all of society. They cannot just be in startups. If they're only in startups, we're screwed. They have to be in academic institutions. They have to be in big companies because startups can only get the low-hanging fruit. If we're going to change healthcare, if we're going to change climate change, we need to have big companies involved with that. We need entrepreneurs in government. We need them in academic institutions. So entrepreneurship now, education, is much more important than it was in the past because we need entrepreneurs everywhere. And why is that? Because change is going faster and faster and faster. You know, if you look at the history of mankind, I hate to tell you this, you're like, this, is, this can't be possible. The world will never be slower than it is today. You're like, that's impossible. It's impossible. It, 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 it just is a fact. If you go back and look at the way technology is going, you're like, no, 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 there was just... You know, the Russians just invaded Ukraine. We're trying to, no, I, I, I hate to tell you this, but we thought we couldn't be any worse when there was Brexit and then Trump was elected. Then we had COVID. It just, it just keeps getting faster and faster and faster. And it's not going to get slower. I don't mean to bum you out. I mean to tell you this is the reality. And the way that we fix that is by having entrepreneurs throughout society. And so... This is a condition that we call anti-fragile. We need people, entrepreneurs, who are anti-fragile. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is it's a concept by Nassib Talib, where he said, you know, fragility are people who break when hit by an exogenous force. These are people, when something changes, it be a COVID-19 or whatever, they break. And you're like, that's not a good thing. No, it's not a good thing, especially when the world's going faster and faster. But the fundamentals of management have been Let's reduce risk, let's get efficiencies, let's get financial leverage, let's optimize the system, let's do Six Sigma, let's do just-in-time manufacturing and supply chains. And what does that create? That creates fragile systems. The assumption in management is that things aren't going to change. And that we know that to be, a we know that things are going to change more and more over time. So then you say, aha, what we need to be is resilient or robust. COVID-19 happens, we're just going to march ahead and we're going to ignore COVID-19. We will not be defeated by it. No, that's not right either. You have to acknowledge the new reality, be it COVID-19 or, you know, or climate change, and we have to fix it. It's not that we ever wish these things to happen. And so this turns out to be the neutral condition. If, if, if fragility is a negative condition, this is a neutral condition. What we need is a positive condition, that is anti-fragility that when adversity happens or if there's change, it's an opportunity. We can't say, you know, we're not going to sit here and deny COVID happened. It happened. It just closed this door. We never wanted that to happen. We never wanted COVID. But you know what? 
let's stop, let's stop crying about that and let's go figure out how we're going to fix this and find out other doors, other windows that we, and let's get people to figure that out right away. A anti fragility is, is, is people, when there is change, they get energized, they get better. And, and just to give an example, how many of you are basketball fans here? So, if you're a basketball fan, you know the greatest basketball player ever played was Larry Bird. But he was not the best player in the, in the first and second period of the game. He was the best player in the fourth quarter. When things got crazy, when it got down and there was adversity and things might go wrong and Mikhail got hurt, so he just, you could see his eyes get bigger. He got more excited. That's, that's the mentality we need. And I forget who said it. We need the mindset of an entrepreneur. We need the mindset of an entrepreneur. And anti-fragility is the mindset of an entrepreneur. But then you have to have the skill sets to be able to do that. But these are people who grow when exposed to volatility, randomness, stress, or disorder. And there's going to be more and more of that in the world. I hate to tell you. By the way, I'll make all these slides available to you if you want. Everything is always, that we do is always open source. Terrible business model if you're trying to make money. But it's great if you're trying to change the world. Um, and this just says that the world's going faster and faster. The people who are, who are holding on to like, I don't want change, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm, those fragile people are going to get spun off and Darwinian selection will be the anti-fragile people will be the leaders of the world going forward. So let me just say nine things that you see in the movies that are not true about entrepreneurs. And I'll go through this really quickly. And the first thing is you got to be like Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg to be it. And entrepreneurship is about mercurial individualists. This is often a, a myth that's propagated by people after the fact, because our research shows very convincingly, and other people's, that entrepreneurship is a team sport. That if you have two founders, you're more likely to be successful than if you have one. If three, then two. Four, then three. It's a team sport. And just think about that for a second. Should that be that surprising? How much in the world really gets done by one person? Not much at all. It's a team sport, and, and you've got to build up your team to be able to do this. Um, I'm not smart enough to be an entrepreneur. Those people are really smart. We were talking about this last night, how you look real smart when everybody tells you everything. Um, but it's not true either. You, you, you are not a successful entrepreneur because you were the smartest one. You were anointed beforehand. You become a great entrepreneur because you say, I am fascinated by this thing, and I'm, I'm not just fascinated, I'm obsessed by this thing, and I'm going to learn everything I can, and I'm going to provide value to the people who, who, who want to use this. Just case in point, um, you know, I, I have my engineering degree from Harvard, an arts and crafts school. That pe people find that hysterically funny that an arts and crafts school would give out engineering degrees. So I'm not a particularly good mechanical engineer. Where are my friends who are doing the haptic device? Are they here? Yeah, there you are. Yeah. So I'm not a good mechanical engineer. I'm not a good electrical engineer. I'm a so-so computer scientist. But when I ran Sensible, you could ask me anything about force 3D force feedback. And I probably knew it. And if I didn't, I would ask you 50 questions. And by the end of the conversation, I would go stay up that night and figure out what the answer to your question was. And I would know it the next day. And because I was so obsessed, you, I would became an expert in that field. I was not the smartest person. But that's how an entrepreneur operates. It's not about intelligence. It's about kind of this commitment, this obsession to, to, to solve this problem. Um, entrepreneurs are born, not made. My parents weren't entrepreneurs. This is, I, I can't, hopefully I've this, you know, gotten you off, disabused you of this. Our research shows it, if your parents were entrepreneurs, great. If they weren't entrepreneurs, great. It doesn't matter. It, this is not nature. It's not a gene. It's not a cultural thing. It is a it's a nurture. We turn people into entrepreneurs all the time. Um, next thing is, I can't be an entrepreneur because I don't love risk. Well, uh, yeah, good luck. If you think there's a place where there's no risk, you're living in a different world. There is going to be risks no matter where you are today. It's just, that's the way it is. And you have to think about this thing in a little more sophisticated way, and that is, it's is uh, Nassib Talib talked about in the book Anti Fragile. If you grow up in a greenhouse and you say every day I, I, I'm not leaving this greenhouse because I've I've only seen this greenhouse. And by the way, it's always temperature controlled. The humidity's fine, and there is no. If I go outside, there are critters and there's snakes and there's temperature and there's all these other things. And so I'm not going to go outside. So every day you say I'm not going to do this. 
and you can kind of go through your career, but then someday that greenhouse is going to get blown away. It's just a fact. <laughs> we, have a, we have a friend who worked at the U.S. Postal Service. He thought he had a job for life. They told him you have a job for life. That's not working out really well if you're in the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, we were told we had a job for life when we got hired by IBM. Uh, they meant it. it. It just doesn't work out that way anymore. It does not work out that way anymore. So if you, you need to get out of the greenhouse and start learning the skill sets, and you need to let, learn how to take informed risk, informed risk that's worth it. And so the example here that we talk about is if you're doing uh, the MIT blackjack team went in, and how many of you have seen the uh, movie about the MIT blackjack team? It's called, it was called Bringing Down the House. 21. The book was Bring Down the House, and then 21 was the movie. Yeah, really interesting about how MIT people trained and they would go in. And they would never play a stupid game like this or, or one on branded. You're just, your odds are not good. That's, that's dumb. So why did the MIT team go there? Because they played blackjack. Why do you play blackjack? Because first of all, the odds are much better, but they're still not good enough. But you have agency. You can make a choice that will improve your odds. Okay, but your odds still aren't in your favor if, if you play blackjack, unless you can do one thing. What's that? Count the cards. If you can count the cards, the odds flip in your favor. So if I can count the cards, I'll play blackjack with you. Because <laughs> I'm going to win in time. I'm going to win in time if we play blackjack. And here's the thing is, everybody knew that. Everybody knew that. So the casinos have, I don't know, it works at a casino here. They all have cameras around that. So what, what was new with the MIT team? They had one brilliant insight, brilliant insight. The casinos assumed that women could not or would not count cards. They assumed that they would not or could not count. So the cameras never watched and the people never watched the women. What did the MIT team do? They welcomed a woman to their team. They trained it. The woman counted the cards, sent them over, and they would win. And they'd finally, when you saw in the movie, they'd throw them out. They couldn't figure out how they were winning. Here's the point. They had an insight, they had an advantage, they had information asymmetry that flipped the odds into their favor. And then should you take that bet? You should take that bet every day of the week and twice on Saturday and Sunday, because you're going to win more often than not. That's called informed risk. And that's what, we, that's what entrepreneurs do. They don't go into the casino and pull the uh, one-armed bandit with losing. They don't take dumb risk. They take intelligent risk. Entrepreneurs are successful because they're charismatic. They can sell ice to Eskimos. Uh, that's terrible. Uh, that is not what entrepreneurs do, just to be clear. If you do that, you're not going to be successful in today's world. You know why? Because if, you wake, if I sell something and the next morning the customer wakes up and they say this isn't a good product, what are they going to do? They're going to complain about it. They're going to get online. They're going to write a review. They're going to tell their friends, oh, this product is bad. You're much worse off of not, you're much better off of not having sold them that. You have to sell authentic value. Because your best salesperson that you're ever going to get is your existing customer. That is just a fact in today's world. <laughs> your best customer you're ever going to get is your existing customer. You better sell on authentic value. Um, entrepreneurs are lucky. This is another one when you look at successful. I'm not saying there aren't some lucky entrepreneurs. That, you, know, you, can, you, can, you can go out and buy a lottery ticket and win. The odds just are terrible for you going back to risk. But intelligent entrepreneurs, how you improve the odds are by figuring out where's that opportunity, like Malcolm Gladwell says in Outliers, and then saying this opportunity is coming. Everyone's going to have, a, uh, 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 we think that a lot of people are going to have smartphones. Oh, what does that mean? What are the ramifications? Well, that means that uh, we can do, they're going to have GPS systems. So we could probably do, we can identify where they are. We could do location-based advertising. This is what the people from AdMobs did. They went and they said, that won't happen for two years. But they started now and they got their, as Malcolm Gladwell calls it, 10,000 hours in so that when that day happened, they were there for it. They were there for it. And so thinking about when's the opportunity coming in the future and how do we prepare for it is the way that you think as an entrepreneur. Where's the gap? When's it going to happen? Let me time it for that. And again, to use a sports analogy, or if you can call it a sport, ice hockey, Wayne Gretzky wasn't the fastest skater. He wasn't the strongest. He wasn't the best. But he, they, they, you know, they, they said, Wayne, how are you so good? And he goes, it seems to me that everybody skates to where the puck is or, or kind of close to it. I anticipate where the puck's going, and I skate there. I skate there. And that's, that's, that's what you train entrepreneurs to do. And it looks like luck, but it's a lot of hard work. And it's... 
Uh, entrepreneurs are undisciplined. You know, um, this is, you know, the, the idea that I see these people and they're undisciplined. I'll tell you, that is the biggest misnomer I, I, I had going into this. Um, I had these other ones, but this one, because when I was at IBM, it was where we had the Brooks Brothers 42 long suit, a, a white starch shirt, nice red tie like the man has right here. Um, black wing tip shoes, you always arrive 15 minutes before your boss to work, never leave 15 minutes after. You have a clean desk, do all this other stuff. And then I did a startup and I realized none of that stuff mattered at all. None of it mattered at all. You know why? Because you wouldn't make payroll if you focused on that stuff. What you needed to focus on was, will the customer buy our product and will they buy more of it and tell other people they like it? Because if we didn't, we didn't make payroll. This was a very immediate thing. You know, well, when we were at IBM, it was like payroll came from God, you know, twice a, twice a month. Here it comes, you know, let's get dressed again and let's go play games and meetings and play meeting lizard and go around. It, it, that's not what happens at a startup. Again, basketball analogy. John Wooden said, never confuse activity with achievement. Never confuse activity with achievement. Never confuse appearances with progress. And that's what you learn as an entrepreneur. So when you see an entrepreneur and they seem crazy to you, uh, if they're successful underneath, they have enormous self-discipline. Or I guess discipline isn't a good word, I've been told, Nikos. It's some other word in Greek, principled. But I call it discipline. The other thing is that entrepreneurs lose all the time, you know, or 90% of the time. I think I've showed you data. If you know what to do, your odds are much better than that. And there's a, a, a very enjoyable book. It's not the most rigorous book in the world. He talks about how David beat Goliath, and people think that's unusual when it's not unusual. And why is it not unusual? Because you all know the story of David and Goliath, right? Goliath, this enormous giant, no one will fight him, biblical story. And finally, they get little David to fight him. Like, how could David beat Goliath? And David has an insight. He says, I'm not going to fight. You know, Goliath says, come out and fight me, David. Says, I'm not going to fight you the way you want. I'm changing the rules. I'm going to use a slingshot. Because what's, you know, well, that's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? Those are the rules. You want to you fight? We're going to fight the way I want, not the way you want. Who's making the rules here? And, and David makes the rules, and instantly, instantly, with the change in the rules, Goliath's size becomes an enormous liability because now he's an easy shot for his slingshot. And his agility becomes a, a liability. And so by flipping the rules, the game totally changes. And he goes through and shows how Smart Davids beat Goliath, you know, in military battles 60, 70 percent of the time as well. Last thing I'll say is that, oh, I don't have a great idea for a startup. The original idea is the most overrated thing in entrepreneurship. My colleague Matt Marks showed in his research that people start with ideas. They do this thing called switchback. They have an idea. You have to have an idea to start with because that's how you coalesce a team and get things going. But that idea changes over time. As you figure out who your customer is, that idea changes. And you figure out who's the customer and who's, gonna, who's the end user, who's the economic buyer, who's the champion. And then we execute with discipline against that, which is this process. And that's how you create a company. And this is a success pie. This is the smallest part, figuring out who your customer is. And then this is the next biggest one. And the biggest one of all is having a great team. And how do you build those teams that have a common vision, shared values, and complementary skills. I'm not going to talk about that unless you want me to later. But um, So those are the misconceptions. How do we teach it? How do we teach it? The first thing you have to say is entrepreneurship is a craft. It is a, like pottery. It is not a science. There will never be an algorithm to teach you how to be a successful entrepreneur. You can't. because. Entrepreneurship is about doing something that's novel and new. And, the, and when someone does it, that's, that's entrepreneurship. You can't do that again. You've now got to do something else that's never been done before. And how can you have a science to do that? You can't. And you say, oh my god, that's scary. Then it's art. No, it's not art. Because art is opera or singing or painting or something that engineers could never possibly do, right? It's, it's like pottery. It's something that everyone in this room can do. And you could be taught how to do it. And you could build something that's unique. It's something everybody could do. And you could build something that was unique. But you could learn how to be a better potter if we, uh, pottery if we taught you. And 
we just have to teach you those first principles, but it doesn't ensure that you're going to do exactly the same thing as other people. But once you know those first principles, you can get much better at your odds of success, but we can't teach you through lectures and videos. This is an apprenticeship model, which is why what the Enterprise Forum is doing is so important. You get people out there, wrap theory and practice together. So this is, this is um, how we teach it. And let me just kind of finish by saying, what's a successful entrepreneur education? What makes a successful entrepreneur? We talk about the four H's. The first is heart. You've got to have that mindset, that spirit. We say the bird sings from within. What do we mean by that? You can't, appreciate, you can't just settle for what everybody else is doing. You've got to enjoy hacking the existing system. If, the, if you're happy with the status quo and you want to optimize that mindset, Good luck. I think I've told you that creates fragile systems. Do we need some people like that? Yeah. Do they look happy though? No, no. <laughs> Is there bias here? Yes, there's some bias here. <laughs> but you have to be willing. And we call this, we call this hacking at MIT, but hacking has some con negative connotations, even though we have etiquettes of hacking at MIT. MIT is a different place, just to be clear. Um, so you can call, think of it as creative irreverence. But we, we say it's more fun to be a pirate than to join the Navy. And if you come to our center, um, and the students will tell you this, we have like a pirate flag and we have all this stuff up there. And, and you see, this is our little logo down here and all the old white guys at the top say, that's a nice logo. And all the kids go, hey, look at that, there's some pirate ships and the old white guys don't even know it. Um, so it's more fun to be a pirate than to join the Navy. That's, that's the spirit we want. That's the spirit, the mindset. So, but as you heard, it's not enough to just have the spirit of a pirate. That's the first part. You then have to have the execution skills of a Navy SEAL to be successful. And this is, this is the balance that you must have. This is a balance. So what are those execution skills? They start with the knowledge. Does that mean my time's up? Um, they start with the knowledge. You, if someone's excited to go into battle, we have to say, here's the techniques. Here's those first principles. And, the way, to not, the way to not do it that's unrigorous that has been done for decades before we, uh, we, we really got into this is just storytelling. Storytelling is not a way to teach entrepreneurship. I chose success. You should choose success. Watch this movie. That's not the way you do it. It's got to be evidence-driven. And what you need to do is build up a toolbox of things that we know work, proven, evidence-based tools that work. Yet the field of entrepreneurship has been obsessed with whatever the shiny new thing is and the latest new book. And these things are not generally, some of them are academic, but generally not. And they just come up with, ooh, do this thing. With, forget, wait, what, what, happened to, what happened to Blue Ocean? What happened to Crossing the Chasm? No, it's all lean now. And this is not the way to run a serious body of knowledge. And so what, we, what we've set out to do is to collect those things that are good from any of these things and many other places that aren't even in academic books at this point. They're practiced at Procter & Gamble, they're practiced at IBM, they're practiced at any other place, Hewlett Packard. And we vet them in, in, using the rigor of, that you have in an academic institution. And this is why academic institutions are so important. You have to have rigor and relevance to create a serious field. And we saw that from medicine. So that's what disciplined entrepreneurship is that. It's taking an engineering, toolbox approach to how do you solve this problem? And so it starts with who is your customer? And you start up here with an idea, technology, and you go through this. And so let me just, I'm not gonna go through all these steps, but let me just say, what, what is who is your customer? Well, you might've heard this through Simon Sinek's video. You know, don't start with the how and the what, start with the why. Well, actually, before you start with the why, you gotta start with the who, the why for who. And this is called, you know, now called design thinking. That's a very popular concept. It's been called user-driven design. It's also what Procter & Gamble did for decades before that we know works. When you go back, look at the history of Silicon Valley, so many of those people went through Procter & Gamble. It's shocking. So you start with who's your customer, not what you want to do, but who and why, and then you kind of go through the sequence of what can you do for them? How do you create value? Remember I said create value? And then we talk about how do you extract value? all of this in a very methodical way. This is a sequential, so you should always know where you, what your next step is. 
But let me be clear, it is not a linear process. By that, I mean you always know what you should be doing next. But as you do it, you go back and you update steps before it. And you might even get, oh, we just sold some stuff. And, and some of that. Well, if you, that happens, good for you. But you better go back and do these other steps. Otherwise, you're building a castle on a foundation of sand, and it's not going to be disciplined. So we have lots of examples of this, but I'm just going to go through now and kind of wrap up. What, this, what we've seen this book do, and this is really exciting, is it gives a common operating system. It gives a common language. You can now talk to anyone at MIT or the like, and now when you say, oh, here's, here's, my, new, here's my new company, Nikos, wait, what's your, what's your TAM? And he knows exactly, I'm talking about total address more. What's your TAM for the beachhead market? Yeah, the beachhead market, and we know what we're talking about. What's your cost of customer acquisition? What's your lifetime value? What's your persona? What's your, you know, what's your user acquisition? All these things are kind of become a common language, and that becomes extraordinarily powerful as we're going to talk about to create a community. But you can't learn these unless you have an apprenticeship model. And this is why, while we're teaching the first principles, as you give your lectures, and, and it, then you have to, they go out and do it, and then you have to come back and say, all right, here's what you did well, here's what you not, don't do well. You know, LeBron James, arguably the most talented player, he, after each game, he sits down with a coach and says, okay, this is what I did in the game, what can I do better next game? This is the theory practice loop that makes you better over time. And we have a whole system here, and you'll build an ecosystem here, so you can go between theory and practice, so you can take someone from inspiration, exploration, and get them to acceleration and to achieve escape velocity. You will build your own system, and these are the systems that, that you're, put, you're putting in place now. And then you repeat, you repeat that system and give people a chance to do it again. And it's not a linear process as well. When you go through this, you're constantly changing your idea, changing your team. You're, you, you need a safe space in which to do this stuff because it's never going to work out the way you thought it was. It's never going to work out that way. So let me just try to wrap up here and say the last H is very, very important. Entrepreneurship is not just a mindset and a skill set. It's a way of operating that is different. This way of operating is different than what we're taught in management school, what I was taught at IBM, what you're taught. Command, control, conquer. You must own the resources. You must control those resources. Entrepreneurship was defined in a very interesting definition by Howard Stevenson at Harvard as the pursuit of opportunities with resources beyond your control. Why is that important? This is a different way of operating, just to be clear. This is a community way of operating that is different than we have historically been taught. Why is this important? Because first of all, you can move very quickly. You can run experiments very quickly. If I come up with an idea and I can call up, I, I can call up Vasily and, and say, oh, Vasily, I have this idea. Can you help me on that? And I don't have to hire him. I don't have to get him up to speed. If he thinks that I am a good member of the community, and knows I'm going to help him and I bring value to it, then he'll help me. And, 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 and then when, when he needs something, he'll call me. So when something happens, you can try out things very, very quickly. And best people today don't want to be command, control, and conquer people. They want to have their options open to them. So it's all about getting the talent. This community way of operating is not as clear to people as it, it, these other things, like the mindset and the skill set. But let me tell you, it is what makes for a huge difference. And in today's world, that is much more possible than it's ever been. So um, I, I, will, I, I think Greece can not only uh, continue the success it's had, but I think it could easily become, and we talked about this this morning, you've been the cradle for democracy. I think you could become the cradle for, you're only 10 million people here. You can move very quickly. Remember talking about clock speed? You could take this country and you could create millions of entrepreneurs very quickly. They could speak the same operating system, same language. And I believe if you had a nationwide competition here with you had a big prize and everybody kind of worked together, you know, you could do this relatively quickly. You could get the programming, what MIT Enterprise Forum is, you know, EY has done with more, and you could change the hearts, heads, hands, and homes for millions of people. You could integrate all this together. You could have a common operating system, and you, again, could be that shining light for the rest of the world, because we sure need it. Uh, I, I don't want to get dark here, but 
You created, helped us create democracy. Democracy isn't working like it's supposed to. I can tell you from the United States right now, because democracy wants an educated, rational thinking populace. And that's what we need. And have you ever met an entrepreneur who's not rationally thinking? It creates that self-discipline for them. And that's where, I bet if we had a lot more innovation-driven entrepreneurs in a place called Russia right now, they wouldn't be, in, they wouldn't be invading other places, right? And, and it just solves a lot of the problems of the world, but we need someone to step up there and do that. So that's my call to action. Um, I don't mean to get too heavy. Is it time for questions, Vasilius? Okay. Am I okay with not wearing a mask? Yes, of course. Okay. Yes. I have from MIT, we believe in science. Even if some people in the United States don't. Thank you for the great presentation. I actually ran through 57 slides and it felt like it was tense. Like, you know, that's, that's a, a skill that <laughs> it's that's very useful. Uh, <laughs> I really. <laughs> Anyway, um, I would like to invite you to uh, uh, ask questions to Bill. Please be short and be specific. Uh, in, in front of you, there is usually a mic. Use that because we are recording uh, and we want people to hear. So let's have it. Any questions? Yeah, use the mic, please. Check, check. Um, my name is Alex. Uh, I was in the MIT forum competition two years ago, and we were the second runner, uh, the second uh, with the runner-up for that. Um, yeah, for that year. The question for you, Bill, is: um, I know you mentioned how important the team is yeah. in success. Yeah. In your experience, how did you keep that team of yours motivated? So first of all, um, congratulations going through the program. And uh, hopefully the competition to like win it didn't um, create a lack of harmony and community amongst your group. Because don't worry whoever wins it, you're all winners if you go through the program, you become an entrepreneur. So, um, so the question was, how do you go about making a team, a great team, or what, what was it? Keeping them motivated. Keeping them motivated. So in this book, and I don't, Nikos, I, I, I can't read it. It's, it's literally Greek to me. Um, uh, in the second book, I talk about you have to have a raison d'etre. Uh, raison d'etre is, is a Spanish term that means reason for existence. Um, that's a joke, actually. I understand it's French. <laughs> it's a bad joke, but that's what, that's what you get. Um, a raison d'etre means why are you there? Entrepreneurship is not about profiteering, just to be clear. It's about bidding an organization together. We talk about this. Entrepreneurship is an ethical activity. When you get a team together, you are trying to do something. It's just like when you're born, you, you don't come out and your parents don't say, your, your objective is to breathe and, and live. You, you, your parents say, you, you should make a positive impact in the world. You do it. And that motivates you to do that. It's the same thing with a startup. Why are you, what, how are you going to put a dent in the universe? How are you going to do that? And a startup will go through these ups and downs, but as long as they believe in that vision you have and you're reemphasizing that vision, you can make it through that. That is, that is the first thing, raison d'etre. And the second thing, which I'm really happy to hear, is the other thing is, is sharing in the upside for them, right? And that's the stock options. And, and, and that is, that's something that sounds like you've changed. And I go to some countries and you can't do that. There's a certain, remember, you want you you don't you don't want to you don't want to be you and your founders be the only entrepreneurs in it. You want everyone in your company to be an entrepreneur. You want them to have hope every day when they come in that this company is going to do that. You want them to have pride in what they do. You want them to have rigor in what they do. And you do that by by sharing ownership with them. So first of all, raison d'etre, and then the second thing I would say is you know sharing the ownership. And the third thing is just to be clear is. When I say community, you, you have to build a strong community. That means every person on your team needs to be strong. Um, I'm not saying 
I, I, you, you, you know, this is capitalism. This is not communism. I'm sorry, but this, there's, it's the law of the jungle. Rudyard Kipling said, the strength of the pack is in the wolf. If you want to have a strong pack, every wolf needs to be strong. But, the, but each wolf needs to understand that the strength of the pack is not just in the wolf, but the strength of the wolf is in the pack. So each wolf needs to be strong in your team, and they need to understand that they, need, they are part of a great team, and that's where they will realize their destiny. They will re realize their glory. So it's that kind of team-oriented people that you need, but everybody needs to do it. Again, I can't call it facility and be a taker all the time. I need to contribute to that, and that's, so you've got to create your wolf pack, so to speak. Thank you very much, ministers. <laughs> Hope to see you in soon. Please use the mic. There's a mic in front. Uh, hi. Uh, I'm Gregory Ivanov, a mixer of uh, entrepreneur and uh, professor of entrepreneurship. Oh, great. So, At what university? Uh, Southern Cal. Okay. USC uh, and NTUA. Right. Uh, so uh, a personal question. What prompted you to make the jump out of the corporate world to professorship and entrepreneurship? And whether the corporate world uh, helped you build the discipline? So why did I leave? Why did I? Why am I not a? Why am an I an IBM. academic why, and not an why entrepreneur? Did you leave IBM? Yeah. So why did I leave IBM and become an entrepreneur, or why did I leave being an, uh, being an entrepreneur and become an academic? Both. Both. All right. So why did I leave IBM and become an, uh, and, and become an entrepreneur? Interestingly, because I went to MIT, first of all. And when I went to MIT, I had been at IBM for 11 years. And, and I'd been there from 1981 till 1993. And I had seen the personal computer revolution happen. And I had seen what was going on. And, and I, I was just enthralled by it. This goes to, I'm a basketball player. And I love, you know, I had done better than I ever expected. That I'm sitting here talking to you just blows my mind. Because I'm just a kid who woke up every day and wanted to go play basketball. Like Giannis. That's all I wanted to do. I just wanted to go down the playground and play basketball. And... And when I was at IBM, I ha you know, you have to, you have to work, and, and I may, and all of a sudden I was like, wow, this, so what is my next job going to be? What, if, if I do everything right, I looked at the job that I had, and I said, that's not the job that, that will get me excited every day to go to work. Um, what these other entrepreneurs are doing is what gets me excited. To me, that was going to the playground and being uncomfortable, but, you know, and, but that brings out the best. And I knew that even if it didn't work out, it was still going to be okay. I could get a job. But I wanted to do something that stimulated me, that got me excited, that was exciting as going to play basketball. And um, that's why I became an entrepreneur. And by the way, my first company, it's not an upward trajectory. My first company is in deep, deep stealth mode. Do you know what that means? It went out of business. <laughs> it was, a, it economically was very unsuccessful. Nikos, I'd hate to tell you this. But it's a, the first company, the odds are not good. But it's like a pancake. You got to get that first pancake out of the way and get to the second one. And then you can figure it, you can figure it out. And then you know what you're doing. And so the first one was not successful, was financially very unsuccessful. But I knew this was the game I wanted to play. And it was going to be OK. It was going to be OK. And going from, my wife might say she didn't know it was going to be OK. But, um, but I knew it, I was going to be OK at that point. And then I did the second one, which was you know, technically infinitely uh, more successful. Because if the denominator is 0 and the numerator is anything, it's infinite. Yeah. And so. But that really wasn't that successful, but I just loved the game. So that's what I did, and I did it three times, and it's exhausting. And then after the, th the third one, 
the MIT had asked me to come back and teach, and so I went back to kind of regenerate. And then, um, you know, through a series of events, they called me up one day and said, how would you like to run the, the entrepreneurship center? I said, what are you talking about? You know, no, I don't want to do that. And they said, well, these students won't have an entrepreneurship center because if you don't do it, we don't know what we're going to do. I said, no, you can't do that. They said, well, then you just do it for four months. That was 15 years ago. And um, I will, I will, I'll probably do it till the day I die because it's, it, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you affect this many people with what you do. When you're at MIT, you have the ability to affect this many people. So I have tremendous amount of respect for academics and their force multiplier effect. And, and there just is no field of rigorous, relevant entrepreneurship. So I feel like even though I'm not, you know, I'm not an intellectual, I don't have a PhD, the academic institutions need someone like me who's in there like beating them up and saying, no, this, your rigor is not relevant. You know, we need relevance and rigor. And so that's kind of my role, but you know, would I do this if I was 30 years old? No, I, I did it after I had three, three of these and I kind of did that and I had this great opportunity. It's, I, there's not a real plan. There was never a real plan here. It's just kind of, you roll with the punches and you see what happens next. Hi there. Uh, my name is Adonis. Uh, I've graduated from MIT, um, and I've done a few startups. I was, I want to say lucky, but you said that there's no luck. Uh, they, it was, um, they were successful. Do you have any tips, though, on how to find agreement between the partners? Because you mentioned that the more co-founders you have, the higher the chances. Yeah. Uh, the first startup that I had was with a co-founder. Yeah. The second one, I was uh, on my own. In the first one, I, thought, I think we found it extremely difficult to agree on so many things, in yeah. pricing, which customers to, uh, to hunt for, the, uh, who to fire, who to hire, what to make investments on. And it's not that you think that the other person is dead wrong. Yeah. It's, just a, it's a difference of opinion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any tips on that? Yeah. So first of all, while you were the sole founder in the second one, when we look into these things, it turns out like, there were other people you had in your inner circle. You were just the CEO. So these were kind of like you were the founder and they were the co-founders when, when we look into this thing, these things. Because you couldn't have done it by yourself. So you, so you brought in a team. So the question is, how do, you, how do you set up a functional ability to work with other people? And, you know, we do a lot of training of this. You know, um, it's, sometimes it's hard for people who haven't had that. You know, are you an only child? No. Okay, good. That's, that's a good start. <laughs> But, you know, you have to learn how to have difficult discussions with people and realize that if everybody agrees with you in the room, there's too many people in the room. And entrepreneurship, the fundamental premise of entrepreneurship that you must grasp is no matter what you think, it's, it's almost surely wrong. It's almost surely wrong. There's a great book by a guy, a friend of mine named Mark Randolph, who started Netflix. And he was the first CEO of it. And the book's called, and I recommend this book to all of you, it's called, That Will Never Work. That Will Never Work. And he, the, the book starts off with him coming up with the idea for Netflix and telling his wife, and what does his wife say? That will never work, right? <laughs> and then he goes through the book and he did all the crazy stuff and then Netflix goes public. And you think he's gonna say, see, I, I, I can tell my wife it worked. And he's like, my wife was completely right. The original idea we had would never have worked unless we did all these various changes along the way and we did all these different things that had it. And so this, this humility that you don't have the answer um, is critically, critically important to, to, to your, you and your founders that that will never work. And he says that. He goes, in the book, he says, nobody knows anything. This is, this is Netflix. That's the, nobody knows anything. All we have are hypotheses that we need to test. And Bring data if you think it's right or wrong. And so that's what I would say. If, if, if you and your founders are sitting in a room making these decisions without data, without a kind of recognized way to do that, that's not an evidence-based way to do that. And, and the more you can move towards doing that, the better off a, uh, um, it would work. So and, and you, and it's not true that you can just work with anybody either. There's, there's, you have to have rules of engagement. You have to kind of have a ph philosophic, you have to have a common vision. And then there's just this kind of like energy amplification. 
So if, if we're going to work together, if, you know, one plus one never equals two. It's, it's just ne when it comes to people and startups, one plus one never equals two. It's not like we're going to be roommates and we're going to live in different you know, rooms and then we're just going to go every day and do that. When you're in a startup, Nikos and I are, 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 are working with each other and we have to work with each other. And if we don't work with each other, one plus one equals less than two. But if we can work with each other and he gives me energy and I give him energy and he can give me ideas and I get ideas, then one plus one equals a lot more than two. And that's the person that I should hire. And if I compromise and say, eh, good enough, then you're never going to have a great company. So you have to start at the beginning, I would say, by working with people who are energy amplifiers and in instill that with everyone. Because if I, if I compromise, I say, well, Nikos and I don't get along that well, but hey, it's better than nothing. Well, what's he going to do? He's going to hire someone who doesn't, and you're just going to get into this, this bad, bad situation. So I would say, first of all, uh, the rules of engagement, agree, disagree. Make sure that you have these common visions and the like, and you can have the difficult discussions, but also look for that energy amplification co component of it. Good luck. What were the businesses you, you exited in? in? One was in, in sports marketing. Yeah. The other in trading with AI. Wow, great. What course were you at MIT? Course six? Oh, civil engineering. Civil engineering. Wow. Well done. Yeah. Nikos, you should get him to come to your class. Yeah. Do you know Nikos? He teaches sports management. You should definitely talk to him. Yeah, for sure, yeah. He's looking for case studies for the next version of this that are, that are from Greece. So if you have any you know, nominations for case studies for this, for the next one, to kind of customize it, Nikos is your guy. Yenny. Yeah, turn it on. Hi, Bill. Uh, Yanis Tamoulis. Um, uh, I had took your course at Sloan, Sloan <laughs> a few fellow. years back. Yes, yeah, Sloan Fellow. Um, and I have gone through this book uh, many times in my career in a corporate environment. Yeah. So I think uh, the 24 Steps is a very good um, guide uh, for not only for startup ideas, but also for ventures new product launches, new solutions within a big corporate. So yeah. I very highly recommend it yeah. for that. Uh, my question to you is, uh, I read a few days ago um, an article on MIT News about the history of the course, New Enterprises, yeah, 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 yeah. which started in 1961, uh, and you have taught all, obviously. So my question is, if you look back into the early years of the course, uh, the years that you have taught the course, what has been the profile of the successful entrepreneur and how has it changed um, if it has yeah, over the years well great Thank great you. question so it's good to see you guys and congratulations you just got promoted right corporate venture capital coca-cola well done um, so the profile changed dramatically when I first started the course it was all about people who are like I got to do a startup I got to start a company John Hirschtick you know, Brian Halligan. These were like what we call ready-to-go entrepreneurs. I'm going to start a company. That's why I'm here. I got to get it. Give me this. You know, so they were just what we call classify the personas, ready-to-go entrepreneur. And then over time, the course got much bigger, you know, and then it was like it went from 35 people to 200 people to more than 200 people. And all of a sudden, we did it. We used our own tools and we said, who are the people who are taking this? And we found out that the ready-to-go entrepreneurs, the people who wanted to start it, had now become a minority, had now become like 20%, 15 to 20%. The biggest portion of them was, I'm curious about entrepreneurship. I, 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 I'm very interested in it now, but I never had the opportunity to do it. And those curious entrepreneurs were kind of exploring entrepreneurship, which is exactly what you want in an educational environment, explore it. And so, um, and then, so that, that only makes up about 70%. Who are these other people? And we started to see people like you, corporate entrepreneurs, who are like, I'm not sure whether I'd be a startup, but I, I, I work in this corporation, and I think they need to be more entrepreneurial. And this, be, this has become a much bigger part of it. At first, it was just Japan, by the way. But now, people like yourself, you know, we have the head of a, AB InBev. I don't know if you Laura Diamond. Uh, not the head of all of AB InBev but she's very high up there. 
And these people are becoming more. And the other one are ecosystem builders, people who want to do that. So we've really seen this change. But this year, all of a sudden, these curious entrepreneurs are much less, they're, they're, they're like now down to 20, 30%. You have ready to go getting much bigger and people who want to join startups becoming much bigger. Corporates is still big and these ecosystem builders are big. So we're definitely seeing it. And by the way, this raises the bigger issue is, you know, I've been doing this now 15 years. The nature of entrepreneurship being spread around the world is unbelievable. I mean, it used to be if we came to this thing, there would be, be a very small group of people and we know everybody. Now, it's amazing. Entrepreneurship is everywhere. It used to be like if you were in Boston or you were in Silicon Valley, you kind of knew someone. But now unicorns are popping up everywhere. Um, I just came from Dubai. It was an amazing crop of people there. The people I met with today, amazing crop of them. We're going to Luxembourg. You know, North Entrepreneurship is ubiquitous at the startup level around the world. And now we're seeing it start to grow into the corporations. But thanks for all you're, you're doing. You've been a great supporter. You never wore a tie to class, Giannis, though. <laughs> One, one in the back. Do you still have a question? Oh, oh yes, yes. So yes, for homie. Th thanks, Bill, for the great presentation today. Uh, so I'm Vasil Apostolos Uranis, co-founder at Magos. Yes. Uh, first runner-up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last year in the meet of uh, competition. Uh, my question is mainly about uh, your endeavor at Sensible. Uh, what was the main, the secret sauce back then, mm -hmm. and uh, taking into account that a hardware solution like Sensible uh, was disrupting uh, the whole human machine interface, what was the main ripple effect that had at that time? So, first of all, why we succeeded at Sensible, you know, this is really kind of summarizes what I, I learned at Sensible, what I wish I had known before I did Sensible. So this really summarizes the head part of it. What, what really made us successful at Sensible was we did this, but then we built the team out. And there's a, in the article in TechCrunch, I don't know if you've seen it, Culture Eats Strategy for Breakfast. The fact was we knew what to do, but we had a super motivated group of people who would do it. And that was really the difference. We had, um, we had a good game plan, but y y you can't get by with game plan. You need people who are going to execute that game plan. And I would say, come up with a good game plan. And you can get a good game plan out of this. But then you got to spend a lot of your time working to make sure the right people are in the right place and they're all being held accountable. And if people aren't doing the job, you do that. Because we're talking about what makes a great team. You know the number one? Um, thing that demotivates really, really good people? Have you know this? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Really, really good people do not want to be sitting next to someone who's not working hard. They, 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 will, they will leave. They will say, who, what, am I stupid? Why am I working so hard? Vasily's sitting there saying, why am I working so hard if Bill comes in a ha half day and smokes a cigarette every 15 minutes and goes walks outside? Who's the fool here? I'm not going to work that hard. I'm going to do something else. Good people want to be with other good people who are working hard towards the cause. So you, you really have to focus on the people aspect of it. That, that, that's it. And the other stuff kind of follow. People go, oh, you raised so much money. How would you raise the money? You know how you raise money? You have a good product. You have a great business. You have a great team. Raising money is not, not that hard. I could go into infinitely more detail, but... <laughs> Hello, my name is Vasco Nofon. Uh, me and my team, we are now in the circle of MIT Enterprise Forum Greece. Um, I want to ask, you know, uh, we, we just now uh, talking with the market and going, we doing our first steps in the market. I want to ask uh, what's for you the best advice you can give for startups that just now taking their first steps in the market uh, so they can make an impact in them. So it can make an impact to be successful. The first thing is you got to be successful, right? <laughs> and so the first thing you do is 
you know, you, you can go through all this stuff, but you have to do really good primary market research. Nikos, where's Nikos go? There's, there's a whole chapter about how to do primary market research, but really doing, understanding your customers' needs, not just by asking them, but by studying them, what they do, by doing the job yourself, by doing competitive products to know what their weaknesses are, understanding that customer journey and how you're going to positively affect that, that's, that's the gold. That's the gold. And if you understand that stuff really well, then it's easy to do this. But if you don't do that, you can't do this. this that, that's, that's, what feeds, that's what feeds the process. So doing really strong um, primary market research, understanding your customer's journey, what keeps them awake at night, what do they fear most than anything else, what makes them get excited, what gets them promoted, what are their friction points, that's, that's it. Don't focus on, we're talking about today, you know, our, our friends over here. You know, we're a virtual reality company. No, 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 don't say you're a virtual reality company. That's not, that's not a problem. That's a technology. Lead with, here's, here's the problem we solve. Here's the problem we solve. Um, so focus on that customer journey. Good luck, by the way. Yeah, gentleman there. And then the lady. I'm George Costa from Democritus University of Thrace. So I'm leaving in a few minutes to catch my flight to go up north. Thank you, Bill. You really motivated me. And um, tomorrow morning I have to teach a class. If I can be one-tenth of what you said, maybe my students will be better. My Are question you a professor? Is... <laughs> Are you a professor? Yes, I am. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so you, all the professors here, you know that all our stuff is available to you. There are videos, there's syllabus, everything's available to you. Okay, I, I'll take it from Nikos. But okay. the, my question is kind of cheesy. Why MIT has so many successful startups and okay. Athenian, uh, Aristotle, Democritus, we have so little, so, uh, I mean, so few success. Yeah, is it yeah. the society? Is that we're not ready? We don't, we're yeah, not the, smart enough? No, no, no. It's, first of all, it's not, you're not smart enough because if I can do it, you can do it. I can assure you of that. Um, it's not smart enough. It, it, it is part the, you know, it's part the, here's, here's where you have agency. It's part to do with the academic system. You know, our academic system has been modeled off the Oxford-Cambridge system. Sorry. It, the Oxford-Cambridge system was set up to train clergy how to train clergy. Truth. Truth for truth's sake. You know what? That's not what MIT was set up for. You, you, do you realize that? I don't know if you know that. You know, that's, Harvard was set up on the Oxford-Cambridge model. Veritas. Truth. I went to Harvard. I can tell you. Truth. Truth. Truth will set you free. Truth produces politicians, they've left now so we can say it, politicians and lawyers, right? How did, how did that happen, right? <laughs> Philosophers. MIT was never set up that way. MIT was set up a land-grant institution to solve the, you know, the problems of the world. It was set up for immigrants and immigrants' kids to man the Industrial Revolution and solve the problems of the world. It's a, it's a, it's a problem-solving environment. It's technically not even a university, it's an institute. We don't have a law school, we don't have a medical school, we, we don't have, you know, I think we actually kind of have a philosophy department. I don't yeah. know where it is. Deep down, somewhere. It is? Yeah, well, yeah. I've never seen it. MIT is an engineering school. It's not even really a school of science, even though there's a school of science there. It is an engineering school. And you know what engineers do? They solve problems. So in that article you were just talking about, about the, I, I said it, people go, oh, you know, you're so great at MIT. I said, no, I'm not. MIT was great at entrepreneurship before I got there, and it's going to be great afterwards. I just happen to be the keeper of this right now. And it's that culture at MIT, which is mens e manus, you know, mind and hands. If you look at the logo of MIT, there is literally a philosopher and a steel worker. Show me another university that has a steel worker on their logo. And it goes to the, remember I was saying the, the four H's, the head and the hands, that's MIT. That's MIT. And so when you have that, you've kind of already got the spirit because, you know, how much do you know about MIT? I'm a I'm a Northern. You're, oh, you're, oh, oh, that's right. You're, uh, that's okay. We all have issues that we need to overcome in life. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but I didn't recognize you until you took your face mask down. And then I, I, I wear my 
Yeah, 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 you look much different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but MIT has been forever the school of the underdogs. And, and if you go out tonight, if you, if, you're, if you can't sleep tonight, just go in and, and Google on YouTube, MIT hacks Harvard football game. And you'll see it. Like, Harvard has always been the school of the elites. That's the school of the 1%. MIT has been the school of the 99%. And they're constantly kind of doing these things to tweak the, the establishment. And, and how many of you know what I'm talking about with the football game? Isn't this unbelievable, right? Yeah. In the biggest game, every, you know, Harvard gets, and they, and they play Yale. It's like Oxford versus Cambridge. And everybody dresses up in their coats and ties and goes out to watch a football game. And rah, 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 da, 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 da. And then the MIT people go down the middle of the night, and they put this, you know, they get a little remote control. This is back when this was really hard. And they sneak in, and they put this little thing under the, under the ground. And so in the middle of the Harvard-Yale game, when they're going back into their huddles, all of a sudden, this balloon comes up, and everybody runs away from it. And this balloon comes up out of the ground, and it says MIT on it. <laughs> and they're like, damn those MIT people. <laughs> but MIT is the hacking. They're, they're constantly trying to change the system. And so, this, so there's the head and the hands that are built into logo. There's, the, there's the, the spirit of MIT from this hacking from the beginning that's in the blood. And that kind of creates the community. And forever it's fostered at MIT. We're not a tops down. You know, if you look at the history of MIT, there's a great book coming out. There's actually two great books out, if you're interested. It's called From the Basement to the Dome, which just came out, written by a Belgian named Jean-Jacques de Groot. It talks about how MIT is not a tops down. They just kind of let people do whatever they want, and they put, you know, police cars on the top of the dome. That's not what you do at, you know, at Harvard. So it, it, all this stuff has built a community, and that's why MIT's good at it. I like to think we've had a positive influence by systematizing it at this point. And they put up, they put up with someone like me, and, they, and they, they want that. But it's there. It's been there for a long time. Go Ducks. Hello. Uh, thank you for today's presentation. So my name is Joanna Mikru, and I was a uh, particip uh, participant of the MIT International Workshop on Innovating back at uh, 2016. And you were there. Thank you for that as well. Same uh, jokes. Do they age? <laughs> Excuse me? The same jokes. Mm -hmm, yes, the same. They age, they, oh, they age well. <laughs> yes. Uh, so my question is not about startups. I come from a family business background. I am yeah. the third generation, and yeah. I'm painfully aware that the third generation is the most dangerous one. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to ask you if there are elements of the startup uh, processes, teachings, etc., that can be implemented in fa family businesses, and if you have any points that I should take into consideration, unnecessary risks, or generally your input on that yeah so all, so it's interesting family family businesses either they're, they're like a bimodal split for what we do they're either much worse or they're much better you have advantages as a family business you do know that right because you can take risks and you can do things that that companies that are public companies can't do so you have to install in your company this kind of risk-taking mentality and design your company to do that not everywhere right you're gonna have to have um, are you a computer science person by any chance so you're, you're basically gonna have to have two operating systems you're gonna have to have some managers that are managing the, the, the legacy business and keeping that going and then you're gonna have to create a safe space for for people to try to create new businesses and have those two not be at war with each other but there is will be some tension with them and then have that, have that work. And you, see, the good thing now is, if it's a family business, you can encourage them to work together and, and, and support both of them. Because in a public company, you tend to, okay, as soon as something goes wrong in the kind of higher risk business, you, you fall back on the, the, the stable business. And so you have a real opportunity to do that. But um, if you add, we have a course called Corporate Entrepreneurship. And you're really more like a corporate entrepreneur, but you actually have a better setup. Because if you're a corporate entrepreneur and you're public, they have enormous pressures to produce quarterly earnings, which you can, you, which can be a big advantage for you. But it also depends, like, um, okay, it's like how, how, um, how do I say this? How aligned is your family? Because if your family is not aligned, then, then it's, it's going to be hard to, 
to take advantage of the family business. It's going to be even worse, potentially, than being a public business. But it, it, the, the fundamentals apply in big companies. They apply in small companies. They apply in family businesses. You're just going to have a governance issue, which will either work to your advantage more so or, or against you. But, but, but do go for it. When you look at these uh, Mittelstands, and uh, do you know what a Mittelstand is? It's family-owned businesses in Germany. They can do amazing things that other companies can't do because they're family-owned businesses. So go on the offensive. It, it's, it definitely can be a positive thing. Okay. Uh, first late. of all, uh, it was a great presentation. Thank you very much for it. Uh, my name is Sakis. I used to be, I used to, uh, to participate in the first ever program of MIT uh, EF uh, in Greece. Wow. So, yes. Uh, un unfortunately, uh, <laughs> my my startup failed. But still, um, you know, That's, that happens. Yes, I know, I know. So I'm working. That on the doesn't make one. you a failure. I, my, if my first one didn't work, yeah. but it was the best learning experience I could ever get. Totally, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, agree more with uh, what you said. So uh, I, I'd like to to make an, uh, another cheesy question. Uh, I really enjoyed the first one, so I, I want to follow up on that. So if we had a magic wand and uh, we could assign you as a Ministry of Technology and Innovation, you mentioned in the presentation that you know we, we can actually um, uh, entrepreneurs are not born, but we can basically create entrepreneurs within the system. Yeah. So what would you do as a Ministry of Technology and Innovation to basically make Greece a nation of entrepreneurs? I would really like great, to. Great, great question. What I would do, they might not, you might not want to, some of them might not want to hear this, but I would, I would put up an, I would, I would go, go knock on the door of every single foundation in, 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 uh, in Greece until I got agreement that, that these foundations are going to put up a million dollars every year for a prize for, you know, for the best um, entrepreneurship thing. And then I'd raise, Three times that amount. Get three million dollars every year to, to make entre, to make Greece the, the the nation of entrepreneurs. You would have a one million dollar prize. It would be given out on December first by Giannis Antetokounmpo and a bunch of other famous people, and it would be a um, it would be something that every single person in Greece would know about. They have a chance to get this, and they have agency to do it because on January first of the new year, there's going to be a a MOOC released that anybody can take, anybody can take, whether you're, and you, 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 have to have, you, you have to have Greek citizenship, I guess I would say, but anyone could take it. You could either live in Greece or you could have a Greek, and you apply, you take this online MOOC, this online MOOC, and this teaches you how to be an entrepreneur. We've done it already, but it would be customized. It would basically take this, it would have Greek examples, and you take this MOOC and you do well. And out of that, hopefully, You'd have millions of people here take the MOOC. What's the cost of that? Zero. Everybody has, basically everybody has internet access in Greece. Am I right? Yeah, you go to a library, you can take, and do you think people would be motivated for a million dollar prize? So there it is. So at the end of, at the end of, at the end of February, on, uh, you know, March 1st, you say, all right, we're now going to, out of all those people who did well, 10,000 people are going to go to the next round. And how do you choose that? By clickstream. Who did the best in this? And then all of a sudden, those people would move to the next round. In the next round now, starting in, on March 1st, you would have a special private online class where people could stay in their places and they would form teams and they get mentorship, but then they would take something and they would have to work to present to a group of specialists two months later. You know. May 1st, and they would be reviewed on May 1st, and then of those 10,000, you would have 1,000 people who, who go. So now you're May, June. May, June, okay. In May, June, then we have another regional boot camps around here, and those 1,000 people are now down to 500 or, or 250, whatever the numbers are. And now those people now go to the, the camp down here, and we have these professors and entrepreneurs teaching a comic. And of, the, of that 500 people, you know, 200 now advance to the national finals here, and they're selected. And then 
once you get to that, now you're like, then for three months, you would have super intense kind of Y Combinator, Delta V experience, and you maybe have MIT people, maybe you go to MIT, and then after that, on, you know, on uh, November 15th, you would kind of have final presentations from those people, and they would be on national TV. And then on December 1st, Jonas Antetokounmpo and some famous people would announce, it'd be like a, a reality TV show that's nice. You know, <laughs> it wouldn't be like Shark Tank or Dragon's Den. And anyone who's on it, and you're celebrating entrepreneurs, and you're saying, this year's winners are, ba-boom, and you know where these people were one year ago? Ladies and gentlemen, they were sitting in front of their TVs just like you are now. If you want to be on this TV next year, take the MOOC that starts on January 1st. And so what does this do? It motivates millions of people to take the classes. And you know what? It's not just the 200 people or the one team that wins. All those people who take a MOOC are now become entrepreneurs. They realize entrepreneurship is possible. This isn't something that we just see on TV that other people do. We took the class, and I'm going to take it again next year, and I'm going to do better. And you know what? They may not even get to be the thousand in the next round the next year, but they know that they're entrepreneurs, and you're convincing a million people, and maybe you make it bigger the next year. And to me, that is how you take a society and make millions of entrepreneurs using the technology we have today. And can it work? I'm 100% convinced it could work. It just needs to be executed. We've already done it. We've had hundreds of thousands of people take our online classes. We've had regional boot camps. Where's photos? You went to a boot camp. Was it good? <laughs> yeah, is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I went to the global one yeah. in Boston. And uh, it was the best investment I ever made in my whole uh, career. I have used the knowledge gained from policy making at the European Commission yeah. all the way to management consulting for big corporations. And I've been teaching this method for the past almost decade to thousands of people around the world, including Greece. And it has cemented all these things that I have learned around business, around research, into one cohesive whole that works. So, a big thank you. From the bottom yeah. of my heart, you know how much I love you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, this is what we can do. This is what we can do. And it's not me that does it. It's like all of you that can do it, you know? And that's all we need to do is get people to believe. It's that community. It's creating that wolf pack. And by the way, the next great transformational entrepreneur might be sitting in this room. You know what? They probably aren't. <laughs> They're probably in some small town out there in some place that we don't know. And how are we going to find them? By that methodology, by casting that wide net and let, giving people that chance. And it goes back to what I said. How are we going to transform society? By giving people hope, by giving people pride, and by giving people rigor. And then they're going to stop doing stupid things and they're going to start treating the democratic process as something that they have agency in to make the world a better place. And that's what we need. And if we don't, I don't know what else we can do, so let's do it. Uh, thank, you all. thank you all for the questions and uh, you know, staying so late. Now we have 10 books. Uh, yeah, well, uh, she cannot draw the, the... Okay, I'll start. You just told me, press start, nothing else. Okay. <laughs> Explodes. I'm sorry, everybody. It looks like we went way over time. My apologies. I get very excited about this. Order. Okay, number 62, Costadinos. Costadinos, come to collect your book. Does everybody have to wait and watch signings? Uh, we can do that. Yeah, why don't we just okay. announce it? So we, we don't, this feels like yeah. a wedding. <laughs> Okay, Nikos Kotaropoulos is the next one. Oh. <laughs> Nico, he paid, he paid the meeting, right? <laughs> Stand by. Okay, I have to wait a little bit for the third one. Yeah, you go, go on. Uh, yours, yes, okay. With, uh, okay, let's Manon. do it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Ta-da. Oh, it's for you. <laughs> Cost
Κώστας Μαυροϊδής. Oh. Ευχαριστώ λίγο κόφι. Every day. Θα το είμαστε τρως έντες. Κωνσταντίνος Φούσκας. I like this game. We need to do it <laughs> more often. Sakis Triantafilakis. Thank you very much. Nikos, we should tell the story. Yeah, yeah. Let's talk. Oh, Adoni. Adonis, ha Adonis has already the English book twice, and now it's. The time for the no, third, no, of no, course. Yeah, you have to donate one or the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> Find the kid in your neighborhood that donate one. Ioannis Rugeris. No, no, we have a couple more. Andreas Chaganeas. Actually, it's Pericles, I suppose. Address is the middle name. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry for that. He was the one that forced you to re to reveal the, the 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 plan that we have. It's like you know now everybody knows that we cannot conquer the world. I really do hope that we can make this uh, a reality. Idea. I have this book twice uh, because I got a, the uh, MIT competition. Can you sign it to someone that I'm trying to convince to be in the internet? You were the one that said you had a way to someone else. find agreement, yeah. Yeah, or you saw the Nakaikis. Okay, uh, they told me I have to wait for the last one. All the winners at the end, please come on stage to have a group photo, all together with Bill and the books, of course. We have another one. Yep. 
He's a slow learner. You know, he has to read it you know, twice. Okay. Okay. Beyond. Okay, it's time for the last book now. Town Town. Oh, John of Gustis. Uh, just a quick reminder for all the women to come on stage for the group photo. Elect, elect, elect.